Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everybody is having a good August. Can you believe we're almost at the end of August? And heading towards a big December eventually, which we all know about, right? So uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is the CED Committee, Committee Community and Economic Development. We should start with the roll call. Patra? 
Batra? Present. Ortiz? Present. Kame? Tor oh. Kame is here. Torres? Present. Foley? Here. All present. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I appreciate your attendance. I know that Council Member Torres needs to leave at some point, but we still have quorum after that. So thank you for being here for the time that you can be. Uh, with that, let's move into, we have no review of the work plan, no consent agenda. So let's move forward to the committee reports. The first report is from, is on the economic development activities quarterly status report. Welcome Carlos. Saludos to the committee and members of the public. Uh, my name is Carlos Velasquez, and I'm the public information manager for the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. Uh, I'll be sharing a recap of our recent blog posts, activities, and communications by our office in the previous quarter. We love opportunities to highlight those San Jose entrepreneurs and business owners who inspire us, and we did so for Asian American Pacific Islander Month in May and Pride Month in June. Pictured in the bottom left is Mai Le of Lee's Sandwiches, whose parents opened up their first shop in 1982 on Tully Road. Mai, a proud graduate of San Jose State University, shared in our blog the challenges she faced as an Asian American, particularly when approaching suppliers, banks, or sponsors. She shared how her and her family's work and her uh, work ethic helped overcome those barriers to become the business we all know today with now 60 locations across the country. Our blog also spotlighted Lauren Burns and Samir Shah, pictured on the bottom right, who opened Voyager Craft Coffee in 2016 as a mobile trailer and now have four locations in and around San Jose, including one just down the street uh, and inside San Pedro Square. We have also done video spotlights on our social media of entrepreneurs from the LGBTQ plus community, including of Roberto Para, a San Jose native who through his company, Para Productions, hosts the su successful brunch and pride events, and Lauren Gutierrez, owner of Silicon Valley Pop-Up, which hosts vendor events all over San Jose. These are just some of the many AAPI and queer entrepreneurs in San Jose, and we always welcome ideas on others that we can highlight in future blog posts or on social media. In June, we published a blog listing the festivals, events, and concerts happening this summer in downtown San Jose, many that you can see on this slide. Our colleagues in the Office of Cultural Affairs are involved with permitting each one of these events, and I'm happy to share the good news that so far this year, they have permitted 61 events in downtown alone, bringing an estimated 1.9 million people to downtown San Jose, and those permit applications are still coming. This is compared to a total of 70 permitted events in downtown for all of calendar year 2022. And by the end of this year, we expect to be close to matching our pre-pandemic numbers of permitted events in downtown. These events have brought a buzz to downtown, giving people the opportunity to explore, enjoy, and support our businesses downtown, while also supporting our local artists and organizations. And the summer is not over yet. Uh, this Wednesday, we will be, people will be dining and celebrating in downtown before they head out to see the Queen, Beyonce at Levi Stadium, and on September 21st, we have one more city dance under the Circle of Palms just outside the San Jose Museum of Art where uh, we'll be featuring world music.
This past spring, we hosted a kickoff for the Cannabis Equity Business Academy, a no-cost, inclusive program that provides San Jose entrepreneurs and underrepresented communities with business education, financial planning, and mentorship related to the cannabis business sector. One of the biggest benefits to the Academy is that the city has reserved 10 retail cannabis registrations to those qualified individuals who complete the Academy. We started with 15 people in the Academy in May, and thanks to additional outreach by many of you here, we are now at 28 participants. But we have space for much more, and people can join the Academy at any time with classes recorded and online and available in other languages or with closed captioning. We'd be happy to provide information about the program to your network, uh, to your offices, so you can share and encourage the public to help us pass the word. North San Jose continues to be a hub for research and development within the city, housing a growing cluster of companies working on emerging technologies. This past June, we welcomed another to the neighborhood with Lighten, a battery technology company opening up their headquarters and manufacturing in Alviso. Their battery technology are producing products that are lighter, stronger, and also lead the charge, no pun intended, toward a decarbonized future. Companies like Lighten are drawn to San Jose because of the access to diverse talent, high STEM college degree attainment, relatively affordable South Bay real estate, and a business-friendly climate. Next month, we celebrate another company to, San to North San Jose with Proceb Biorobotics. We look forward to seeing Lighten continue to grow and thrive here in San Jose. This June and July, our workforce development team helped coordinate the San Jose Works Program, a summer paid work experience program for San Jose youth ages 14 to 18. This program provided work experience for 375 youth who largely came from the Youth Empowerment Alliance with top employers like Intuit, Roku, Create TV, the Children's Discovery Museum, San Jose Library, as you can see on the slide, and many more. As Rupi Carrasco of the San Jose Works Program said, this program serves as a bridge between young talent and employers, fostering economic growth and building a strong workforce for the future of San Jose. We're always looking to connect more businesses and organizations to become participating uh, employers or a mentor, and we'd appreciate any connections or recommendations you can provide. Our Office of Cultural Affairs organizes the Creative License Ambassador Program, which connects residents to art and culture through participatory, community-focused art projects that are organized by an annual cohort of creative ambassadors. This year, some of the programs, some of the, the program ambassadors uh, have been, that they've been organizing have been sketch walks of San Jose neighborhoods, nighttime illuminated projections accompanied by poetry, live painting events, and workshops on 3D printed art made from recycled materials. And I mention all this because the city recently was awarded a $30,000 grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to support the 2024 Creative Ambassadors Program, in which we are now accepting pro uh, applications for, for this next cohort. The deadline to apply is October 6th, and people can visit our Office of Cultural Affairs page, sanjoseculture.org, or social media for more information. And of course, we'd be happy to share more information to your offices. Connecting business owners and entrepreneurs to important resources and tools is how our office helps small businesses thrive. Every two weeks, we share on our social media pages a calendar of upcoming workshops hosted by the city or our partners, as well as through our email list. You, you can see on the slide a few that, we, uh, that are hosted by our partners, Prosperity Lab and Score Silicon Valley, both in English and in Spanish. We encourage folks to follow us on social media at SJ Economy for those listings or to visit sjeconomy.org and sign up for our email list. And other quick highlights we wanted to share with you include that this Thursday, we'll, the city will be hosting a listening forum with the California Commission on Disability Access, where we'll be bringing together small business owners and disability advocates to share their experiences around disability access compliance. 
We have 40 people registered, and it's not too late for people to RSVP. In November and December, we will be organizing a holiday San Jose shop local campaign that will promote some of San Jose's most diverse and unique business neighborhoods, which include Alum Rock Village, downtown, uh, Japantown, the Alameda, Willow Glen, Tully Road and Eastridge, Little Saigon, and of course, downtown San Jose. We are actively recruiting businesses to sign up for the campaign, and we look forward to connecting with your team to enlist your support. Recently, we welcomed several new team members to our business development team, who you can see on this slide. Jessica Munoz and Karina Dominguez will help us increase our support of small, of small businesses, with Jessica focusing on our Eastside business community, while Garrett Stanton and John Castaneda will be helping with our business development, outreach, and our contracts. And finally, we recently completed a series of videos that highlight many of, some of the business neighborhoods that I mentioned earlier, thanks to funding provided in last year's fiscal, fiscal year budget. These videos are meant to support our local small business neighborhoods by promoting the many places to eat, shop, and play at in San Jose. We will be sharing these videos in the coming weeks, but did want to screen one right now about the Berryessa Flea Market. Apologies. Okay. Oh, we can play without audio. We will be uh, posting this video today on our social media if you'd like to hear it with audio if we can't get to it. Uh, if you'd like to share it, and if can, of course, provide your office with this and the other videos as well. And the video is also available in Vietnamese, Spanish, uh, and in English, uh, English, of course. So this concludes our report. Happy to answer any questions from the committee. Great, thank you so much for the presentation. It, it's wonderful to see so much going on in the city of San Jose and particularly downtown. We really need to reactivate our energy, our space downtown and it's really beginning to happen. That's wonderful. I'm sure Council Member Torres will want to be talking about that <laughs> quite a bit. Um, I also just want to mention, I, I didn't catch this in your presentation, so if you mentioned it, I'm, I apologize, but the Pride Parade yesterday was a tremendous success. More attendance than I've seen since I've been participating in this parade, both, both walkers and participants in the parade, but people along the sidewalks watching the parade and, and uh, asking us to hand them our beads or necklaces, whatever we were handing out. It was really fabulous. Just so much positive energy around the LGBTQ community, both uh, allies, supporters, and members of the community. It was just, it warmed my heart to be around such positive energy. Um, with that, I will go to the members of the public and then back to my colleagues. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman. Thanks a lot for this item. Um, I guess, you know, it was, it was um, nice that you're working on downtown issues, a nice report uh, by Councilperson Foley just to hear how the uh, Pride Parade went yesterday. I'm interested in Foley's words uh, who spoke on the importance of December there's something big happening in December. I hope she can uh, better clarify such a comment. Uh, it'd be helpful to myself uh, sometime, maybe at open forum time. Uh, for myself, uh, in this item that was of interest to me, uh, you talked about an interesting uh, battery uh, uh, manufacturing group in San Jose that's using lithium as a major source. Uh, I, I know Paul and myself, we've always made tried to make clear that, uh, you know, 
lithium and, and other minerals uh, that come from other countries. And we have to make sure to have really good worker rights uh, for that lithium mining that we bring to this country, uh, you know, and other rare earth minerals. And it'll be interesting to see those good practices go to work here in San Jose and how that uh, worker rights issues can have a really important effect on how we uh, manage the future of this world, basically. And I think it can help avoid wars, uh, create our better selves, our better practices. Good luck in those efforts. And about downtown issues, um, I, you know, a lot of art things were involved in this item. It sounds like uh, in reading, the, looking over the memo, uh, it, um, you know, the surveillance and tech uh, in, in the downtown area it is actually moving into the art world <laughs> and how those things connect and relate to each other in the downtown area. Be really cautious. If you want to do really good artwork in the downtown area, consider open public practices and participa participation ideas. Uh, I think those are ways to really invent artfulness and creativeness instead of how to be more stingy and miserly with uh, tech practice. Back to the committee. Okay, bear with me as I try to figure out how to use this new system, but I know Councilmember Torres is first. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was uh, really good, so thank you. And then I know that you're all at, are doing amazing work because I, I go to a lot of these downtown events and I see our Office of Economic Development and Office of Cultural Affairs doing a whole lot of stuff. So two things, nothing major. Actually, one of them is major. Uh, so I know that you, you just mentioned Holiday San Jose. And last year when I was uh, running for office, I promised businesses on Calle Willow and the Luna Park area if they couldn't be included in the Holiday San Jose. Uh, last year they weren't. I, and so I'm looking at the 2022 map just so I can make sure that I'm not incorrect. And I am looking at the 22 map and Luna Park and Calle Willow were not advertised for, for Holiday San Jose. So if we can include uh, retail stores or restaurants from Calle Willow, that'd be great. Also Luna Park as well. So uh, those are two very, very important business corridors in, in my district, right? We have amazing ones just like East Santa Clara Street and downtown and Japantown especially. But um, I definitely don't see Calle Willow and Luna Park. So hopefully we can add them to the list. Uh, so uh, the other one is, I. Th I th Good series on the on the on the pride on advertising and promoting LGBTQ entrepreneurs uh, for for Silicon Valley Pride. Uh, I hope next year we can build upon that and we can work with uh, our Rainbow Chamber of Commerce. I know that we have a very very active Rainbow Chamber of Commerce, uh, and that's thousands of of, of businesses. Which, by the way, you know, I think everyone knows uh, that when an uh, entrepreneur is LGBTQ, it's not necessarily just advertised. Their clientele is not just the LGBTQ community, right? Uh, I can, I can, I can go, go down a whole slew of businesses that are owned by LGBTQ leaders that their clientele is just not LGBTQ. So let's work with the, the, the Rainbow Chamber of Commerce but also San Jose Downtown Association. Uh, that's where we, we uh, that's where, you know, we have the influx of folks who are wanting to start a business come in and, you know, they, you know, let us know that they're LGBTQ or they're geared towards the LGBTQ community. So I think um, if, we, if we work with the Rainbow Chamber and the San Jose Downtown Association to, to advertise more LGBTQ folks, uh, that'd be great. So, but, uh, other than that, just you know, super sad that the summer is coming to an end and that we won't be dancing in the middle of uh, Circle Palms uh, for City Dance um, and others, right? As we know, our festival season tends to, uh, tends to you know, August tends to be the peak with, with San Jose Jazz and S Silicon Valley Pride. And so, you know, that's why I think it's, it's very important that, that we, we get folks out and do festivals um, 
in September and October, and hopefully in, hey, even sometimes November, right? Uh, I know last year, or I should say this year, was a very long winter, uh, and so we need to definitely do, a, do as many festivals as we can, street festivals, before the winter comes. And I'm hoping that it's not a long winter like this year, but uh, if it is, you know, it's good for the environment. But other than that, uh, thank you so much for, for the presentation. Yeah, and, and thank you, Council Member Torres, for the comments. Uh, I did want to mention that, you know, we it shouldn't be a problem for us to add Calle Willow and Luna Park to the campaign for, for this one. And uh, just because, uh, you know, there's many business neighborhoods in San Jose, we will be looking forward to, to uh, it's not just going to be a one-time only campaign, but it's just part of a longer campaign, a year-wide year, year -wide, uh, pro, uh, campaign we have to promote business neighborhoods. So, but glad to, happy to add them and, um, add them to the list for holiday San Jose. Great, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ortiz. Uh, first, thank you so much for your presentation. I enjoyed um, looking at all the slides and seeing the great work that our Office of Economic Development has been doing um, uh, for the past uh, uh, cycle. Uh, just to comment on a few of the things that was, was touched on, I'm really excited and I know uh, Nancy and Blage know that I'm really excited about the East Side. Uh, coordinator for uh, small businesses. Um, not a historian, but I think this may be the first time that the city has a dedicated individual resource for Eastside San Jose. So uh, I'm really excited for the work that that individual is going to do and I hope look forward to my office supporting her uh, as well because it's a big region. So I know that um, uh, we, we got to be there to support her um, as staff. Um, um, but really, really excited about that. Next, I, w I wanted to ask you, um, not because I wanted to like, there's like a specific um, like neighborhood that I think you, you left out, but how, how are the neighborhoods uh, chosen for uh, the, the holiday San Jose. San, San Jose, holiday San Jose, yeah. Well, I know that we have a work plan for the entire, mm -hmm. for the fiscal year that includes many or, uh, business neighborhoods, including uh, Monterey, Monterey Road. Uh, we, in the process of developing which which of the neighborhoods we were going to focus on, it was really kind of looking at which of the business neighborhoods have uh, an influx of retail, um, dining, entertainment places, places that might uh, attract uh, folks for looking for looking for holiday shopping or looking to gather for the holidays, um, which is. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that we, we, we kind of, one of the factors that goes into it also is just as, uh, you know, this is part of a larger campaign for us to support the business neighborhoods in general. And so uh, kind of trying to create a balance of uh, which are some of the emerging business associations that we can, that really need our support um, to help them kind of get off the ground. So it's kind of a balance of that as well. And then also just uh, some of our focus areas, obviously downtown is, is, is an important part for us yes. to, to really focus on. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. Uh, sometimes capacity is, is you know, we can't perform the, uh, all of them. So uh, again, just trying to create a, a balance of what we can, what we're, what we're capable of doing. We mm -hmm. want to be able to give each of the business neighborhoods the support that they need. Um, but again, there's a lot of factors and it, just because one neighborhood isn't included doesn't mean that we can't highlight uh, a certain yeah, business yeah. or a certain event during the holiday season. Great, no, it, it, absolutely. And so what, by being chosen as one of these ho holiday San Jose sites or corridors, does, does something come with it? What, what is the city of, do we post events? Is it like deals we're sharing? What does that look yeah, like? Yeah, well, right now we, we are planning on developing a, a holiday San Jose webpage uh, oh, within okay. the city, which is going to be having uh, many sub pages highlighting each of the business neighborhoods that I mentioned. So there's going to be a, a 30, one of the videos that I mentioned earlier will be including it there, a list of some of the businesses uh, that are, are, that people can visit during the holiday season. And we're currently recruiting businesses to sign up to be part of it. So by signing up to be part of the campaign, you're, you're working to get us to get listed onto the web page. And we're really, we're, we're trying to gather stories. Um, so we want businesses to sign up and let us know what's, 
What's the most popular dish that you have it, that you serve? Mm -hmm. What are do you offer gift cards? So we're trying to get information uh, by people who, by the business who sign up. So we have uh, the the tools to mm -hmm. promote them during the holiday season. But by signing up, they they sh um, they're also eligible to get some of the signage posters to be able to let uh, put up proudly on, on their in their storefront and let folks that know that they're involved. Uh, and get some merch, uh, some kind of uh, signage and, and materials to help them promote the campaign. So really, by signing up, they're they're really uh, uh, they're signing up to be part to be mm -hmm. listed into our webpage, part of our, the, the promotion that we do uh, on social media and advertising, and um, and then uh, getting access to some of the signage mm -hmm. for the campaign. Great, great. Maybe I mean we're coming up, we're getting close to December now. Maybe too late, but maybe next year. We could like do some like intentional coordinating. Maybe we could plan events with the business associations and post it on the website or specific deals. I'm, I could see my staff supporting um, your guys, yeah. you guys. And, and the there is work. flexibility for what some of the business associations are interested in doing. So, okay. and so if, if there is an interest in hosting a special event or having something yeah. unique, um, that's something that we're actually encouraging. The, the more activities that are happening in a business neighborhood, the better. Uh, it is for me and in our in our office to to really promote it. So so we are if if there is interest in something like that, I know our small business development team, uh, Jessica, would be interested in working with you on that. Okay, great. No, no, uh, awesome. Um, and then just because you mentioned workforce development, it's one of my uh, passions, and I know you're here in the hot seat by yourself. So if you don't know the answer to this, that's perfectly fine. Um, but do you know what kind of what the handoff looks like once the youth complete? Uh, our, our workforce, sorry, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't remember the name that you shared, but the workforce program, is there like, do they get lined up with another program? Do, do, are they encouraged to register to college? What, is, what does that look, what does that hand off so they continue their workforce development or college career? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I don't know if I know the exact specifics of what happens that's after fine. they get handed <laughs> off. Carlos Nancy's <laughs> joint. Look at that. <laughs> Nancy Klein, Economic Development. Carlos, you're doing an excellent job. Yep. Um, <laughs> the best kind of learning is getting to talk to you all on the <laughs> bubble, so thank mm -hmm. you. Awesome. Um, and he's doing a great job. So in the Work to Future programs, thank you for the question, the, the respondents become a part of the Work to Future family, mm -hmm. so they can dive back in uh, to the different programs that are available. Uh, they uh, Many of them are in, in uh, uh, college programs or community college programs or other programs that are available in neighborhoods. So the, the breadcrumbs continue uh, and there was a celebratory um, uh, ceremony at the end and gave out some thank you and keep doing it kind of That's work um, and an opportunity to keep in line or connected to the employers mm -hmm. that they were with. Okay, wonderful. I, I just know that you know the governor is pushing the Cradle to Careers initiative. I think right. we should be doing that too. And it's not enough for them to just complete the workforce development pr uh, program. We got to set them up for success. So I just wanted to see what Agreed. we were in that. So thank you so much, thank um, you. Nancy. And then um, finally, I know you were mentioning some of the programs that's being offered for small business uh, uh, leaders. Um, I guess how to start a business and different sort of um, services. Are those programs usually always, are always provided at City Hall, or is there an opportunity to do them at community centers in different neighborhoods, or what, is, what does that look like? I know obviously there's bandwidth and stuff like that, but I see Nancy's coming down again, so. <laughs> we can, <laughs> well, I, if I can, uh, if, if Nancy, if I miss something that Nancy would want to add, yeah. um, a, lot of these, or a lot of these workshops are being hosted by our, our partners who mm. host uh, Virtual, they host in-person workshops as well. I know um, that uh, Prosperity Lab hosts their events okay. in person. Um, I, th I think at the, our Work to Future Center at times, and mm -hmm. so they, they they are in different locations. Um, and we do also host. There are they are also hosted virtually. Uh, I think the ones that we really focus on are those that are free or are low cost. So we want mm -hmm. we want to highlight those. But uh, yeah, our partners do host them in a variety of locations throughout San Jose or virtually. Okay, maybe that's something that um, if we could, if we just go on the, the uh, OED website and we can learn when those are, because oh, I could picture my office making a flyer and then distributing it to a business, walking door to door and letting them know like, hey, this is what's going on with OED. 
or something like that. So it's on the website if we want. Well, to right up. now with the, I can I'd be happy to share with them. Yeah, that'd be uh, great. I know Councilmember Kame. I think your office had also asked for interest mm -hmm. in kind of. So I'd love to be able to work with you on when your upcoming newsletters are at, so I can make sure I share them with you. But uh, um, that's something that I'd be happy to do. All right. Good job. Uh, and good and job. then also just wanted to mention that <laughs> with I, I did I did miss that that uh, Alum Rock and uh, and also uh, Alum Rock and uh, Little Portugal are also part of the Holiday San Jose campaign. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw, I saw. No, no complaints from me. I appreciate <laughs> it. Yeah, just just thinking in case Story Road or anybody else in the future wants to what what that process looked like. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great job. Appreciate it. Thank you. Vice Mayor Kamei. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate all the work that's been done. I'm super duper excited of your new staff and having them, you know, I want to welcome them and uh, it's, uh, it's, really, uh, it's really great to have those dedicated individuals. Um, and so I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, you've done a great job. I'm wondering, um, will the will you be able to do more? Is this sort of a sign that well, you know, we've brought some people on staff to be able to do more because I think that if we can continue doing what we're doing and you know increase that somewhat, um, that would just be fabulous. You know, I know that we try to do everything within the the months where we have no rain, but I also think that you know, planning little different things. Uh, I'm excited for the uh, holiday San Jose um, Shop Local campaign. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Um, but I also think, you know, that if we were to do a little bit more, you know, kind of like push the envelopes on either side of spring and, and summer, um, that would be fantastic. Because I think that uh, many people in the community um, are enjoying it. They want it, They want more of it, and I think that this is something that, if we're able to and have the capacity to do it, um, we should encourage that. Yeah, and again, the, the Holiday San Jose campaign is just one of a of a, a year-long effort to really support business neighborhoods, and so. Um, I know that Lunar New Year is going to come up in February. would love to uh, identify opportunities to highlight some of the businesses uh, that people can shop at for, for, uh, or gather for, for that as well. And so um, I'm, we're, we'd be happy to hear what are some events or some things that we can do that we can kind of use as, an, as a way to kind of promote business neighborhoods. And like I said earlier, we're, we're really hungry for stories. Uh, all, all these kind of stories help us uh, illustrate the, the the importance and, and uh, the beauty of some of our businesses and business neighborhoods. So uh, if there are special events or activities or, or businesses whose story that we can highlight, um, we, we'd be happy to hear it. That would be great. And if I could, if I could just chime in, uh, the fact that we are planning, uh, already planning two additional events uh, during Entrepreneur Month and kind of Small Business Month. So for November and May, we'll be carrying on the tradition that we started last year um, we don't know exactly what format those those events will be taking, but it'll be some kind of panel discussion, um, small business networking, kind of resource fair, uh, and a few other things that the, the team has planned. So those are in the work. We're really trying to broaden our scope um, of services and events and networking opportunities for businesses in the city. That's fantastic. I think that's really great. And uh, just expanding those types of things, I think, is very, very helpful. Um, I know that from my office, just as been mentioned, you know, we would love to be able to uh, amplify whatever it is that you're doing. I think that the community needs to know more about the good work that you're doing. And you know, I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that people know. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, what um, Councilmember Ortiz mentioned in terms of the uh, the uh, Work to Future program and and how um, we should sort of think of it a little bit broader. And I don't know if it makes sense to couple some of the individuals with. Um, uh, mentorship we we do mentorship and so uh, that might be something to think about for you know the next cohort or you know how that moves forward but I think that um, just connecting them with um, employment or to businesses um, may not be enough they really need this sort of like ongoing help or uh, assistance 
to help guide them. And I think that, you know, I, I do know that mentorship programs do help in that. So um, that's something that I think, you know, we have to kind of look a little bit more long term to make it lasting or else it just is a one and done and doesn't work. Thank you so much for that. I, it occurs to me that in our next one-on-ones yeah. that I can bring Jeff Russer because there is a, com, a compendium of care, Right. but we'd love to partner with your offices and make sure we're always doing better. That would be great, you know, because I, I do think that um, what we're doing is wonderful, but I think that we could always make it a little bit sort of better here and there, and, you know, from my part, I'd, I'd love to be a part of that. So thank you so much. Nancy, you're reading my mind. I was just suggesting that in my head that we need to do a little briefing about what each different staff member is doing and how they're involved and how we can all work together. So thank you for that. Okay, Council Member Batra. And I'll, I would hope that someone would be making a motion to accept the report. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for the report. And I'm very glad to see that the activity in the downtown is reaching pre-pandemic level. Our airport is getting the traffic the same way. So it's all exciting that the San Jose is fully operational and back in business. Uh, you mentioned about the holiday promotions in downtown, which we definitely need, it's vibrant. Uh, the bedroom community of District 10 also has some businesses. Okay, the retail stores with restaurants and all that. Is any of the District 10 on your list of uh, highlighting? Well, I, I think I mentioned all the neighborhoods that are part of the Holiday San Jose campaign, but again, I think if there are any uh, events or activities or businesses or stories that we can highlight, we'd be happy to include them. Sorry, Blog is Lodge, Deputy Director for Economic Development. So um, as Carlos mentioned, the, we have to have some sort of focus. <laughs> so we're trying to be kind of methodical and strategic about um, the work that we're doing. And so currently, we really have focused on the kind of 11 or 12 neighborhood business districts uh, that we are working in, in, in districts in which we are helping the organizations to really build their muscles. Um, but we are always open to and we invite any stories, any tips that we can get from council members for businesses um, in their respective districts. Um, we are happy to either, you know, reshare kind of um, information that you've already posted or do the follow-up and, you know, do a highlight or a story on those businesses or cluster of businesses. So um, we are open to your suggestions and just because we have um, picked kind of a strategic focus that doesn't mean that we're precluding you know other businesses from other areas of the city uh, to participate so please just let us know if you have some ideas we're happy to follow up so uh, thanks for that what would be the best way to communicate that because we recently had uh, in our district after a long time a new cantina opened which I had an opportunity to go and do the ribbon cutting so I'd like to get that story to you What's the normal or the best way for this kind of activity is there's, uh, as it is coming along? I think for right now what we'll do is we'll follow up with you and your staff and then we'll work out kind of the best way. Um, but it, it's usually just either dropping myself an email or Carlos an email, um, but we can, we can work through that. But we'll follow up with you to, to get those details. Okay, thank you. I, I think that would be very exciting uh, to get these couple of restaurants which just have come up in D10 and give them some visibility and hopefully in business. We'll work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to accept the report? I motion. would so move. Second. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And, and I would like to add that, Carlos, thank you for your presentation, but we do have an annual report that comes to us on Work to Future, and we also have a report that comes to us on small business. So there's uh, a lot of what was embedded in the questions here will come to us in a much bigger uh, business uh, or reports to our committee in the, our coming work plan. We do that those annually. 
Um, I know we're now at uh, 210 and we've got several other big items, but I do have one question for you. Uh, well, two things. I want to encourage everybody to attend the Breaking Barriers event here at City Hall on uh, ADA compliance and disability and access for all. Uh, it's really the second step into adopting the disability pledge that we adopted a couple of months ago or a month ago. It really extends our work to, it really begins our work at at the city level. So if you can make it even just to drop by and say hello, that would be grace. I encourage you to do so and I know you all have busy schedules. Um, Carlos, what I wanted to ask you about uh, is the Creative Ambassadors Program. You said applications are due the end of September. I think October 6th. October 6th. Yes. And where do we get information or could you send the council offices information on how to apply for those grants? What, who is eligible, what the award is, and what, uh, what, what we're looking for. That would be really helpful, because many of us are getting ready to post our September newsletters, and the timing is really perfect to encourage people to apply for those grants. We'd be happy to share that information. Okay, That's great, thank you. And I love the idea of the, the holiday stories. You've given me an idea every, fr every Saturday that we do a shout out of a District 9 small business, and I can see us expanding that during the holidays to shouting out some component of, of the holidays, because like some of these other districts that have really defined business districts, we don't, ha we have vibrant areas, but they're not business districts per se, so we need to help them as much as we can, and we could do that at the local district office. So thank you for that, and with that, let's vote. Great, motion carries five to zero, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move on, and thank you, Carlos. Let's move on to the, the next three items are all development related. The first one is on the de development service process improvements and dashboard. This is a sem semi-annual report, and uh, we have Chris Burton kicking it off. This. Uh, you, I just want to give a shout out to you, Chris, for all the work that has been done on this dashboard. It's been a work in progress and it's really coming together over time. You're listening to comments, you're implementing it, you know what needs to be done. It's, it's really fabulous to see it. So I wanted to thank you for all that. And with that, I look forward to your report. Thank you. Um, thanks for that, Chair Foley. Uh, it, it greatly appreciated. Um, yes, Chris Burton, Director of Planning, Building, Code Enforcement. I'm joined today by a whole team, which is great. I have Rachel Roberts, our Deputy Director of Code Enforcement, Lisa Joyner, our Deputy Director for Building, and then John Tu and Sylvia Doe, who are Division Managers in the Planning Division. And as the Chair mentioned, uh, this is a biannual report on uh, really on sort of challenges um, that the department is facing as, as it relates to development, um, how we're addressing those, and yeah, as mentioned, um, really front and center in our work uh, to really improve our process and our work with our customers is a project that we call our customer service charter, which is you know lovingly referred to as all those dashboards. Um, and so really the intent here was to provide a new level of transparency uh, to our customers so they could understand from an operational performance standpoint what is going on inside the department so they can come at their, uh, their process, at their project uh, from an informed standpoint. And it's not to say that you know this is the direct impact on any individual project. It's to say, hey, this is how things are going. I can get a sense of what timing will look like. And so we've implemented this throughout the department um, in a number of different ways, but really I think that the key piece beyond giving that level of transparency to our customers and working with them in a collaborative way, it's also about how do we organize the department in a way that we can use this information to make informed decisions as we continue to manage the resources that we have available. So um, we implemented dashboard measures across the entire department, um, right the way through planning, building, and code enforcement, and then on into just uh, department wide operations, which I'll get to in just a second. 
Um, so they really start from the ground up. They start from the work team to tell us what are those critical measures that are making a difference to their customers. So we can look at that over time, understand the impact, uh, and continue to make improvements. What I will say is this is not a fixed dashboard. It's continuing for, to evolve. That was always the intent, um, was not to say that we're just going to measure the same thing ongoing. Um, as we make adjustments, as we make improvements, we'll continue to evolve this dashboard so we have a better insight into different parts of our process. So here it is, and I always like to show this one because it's kind of scary, but it's also my favorite slide. Um, and, and the reason we like to show it is there's just a lot going on, right? PBC is a, is a big department. We have 321 full-time positions. Um, you know, we're responsible for a vast array of processes. Um, you know, I think last fiscal year we did 29,000 building permits. We do somewhere in the region of 3,500 planning permits. Um, we have 4,000 open code cases. So, you know, the volume is significant. Um, we're working with a lot, and that's why it's important that we break down this number in a number of different ways. It's also why it's really hard to put it into one number. I would love to give you one dial that was just green and red, and you could see how far along it was going, but it's just not that simple. It's, it's surprisingly complicated. Um, but for me, this is critically important. So uh, with uh, both my executive team and my senior management team, we go through this on a weekly basis so we can understand kind of where this is. It's not just a case of we're putting this out there. We actually use this as an active tool to understand what's going on. Um, a couple of really sort of key numbers for me, and I'm going to talk about why in a second. Um, but, uh, and, and in fact, one I really want to point to, um, it's a little bit of an eye test, so I apologize, but under the building section, so that middle box, um, you'll see permit center, and on the top right within that sub box, it says permits issued on SJ permits. Um, and what that is, is uh, when you think about those 29,000 building permits, about 22,000 of them in the last fiscal year were issued online. So these are largely sort of single family home projects, small things, water heaters, you know, some of those smaller projects that, that people can just go and get the permit themselves, do the work, and then we go out and inspect. Why that's an important measure is it gives you a, a, a probably the best indication of, of sort of market health in that, in that um, environment because it's not delayed by our process in any way. You can literally just see what overall activity looks like. And what you'll see is that it's dipping, right? So we know that economic conditions currently are turbulent um, and we're really starting to see that play out in a number of different ways in these numbers. So I wanted to touch on that a little bit because I think it really is important as we continue to think about our work. So as I noted, that volume is down. We're not seeing it necessarily in some of the bigger projects. Volume is maintaining overall. Um, but there is definitely a shift in the type of applications that we're seeing. So less sort of bigger new construction projects. The affordable projects are starting to slow somewhat on, on the inbound. Um, even on the single family, as I said, we're starting to see a little bit less. Now, uh, as we've noted in previous reports, we have a backlog across most of the department. Um, we've been working really actively to, to diminish that backlog, and we've had a number of successes that the team's going to point out along the way. Um, but as we get sort of closer to that, you'll really start to see the impact of the slowdown and the shift in permitting. Now, um, I'm not going to pretend that I know what's going to happen with the economy. I think uh, we're in this very much wait and see moment right now. Um, you know, uh, you look at the sort of bigger picture macroeconomics, there's a lot of questions. I think we're, we're right at this point where we won't know for a little while until the markets really start to shift. However, in the context of probably, and by some measures, the most expensive place to do construction in the world, um, it's, it's not great for us, right? So construction costs are at an all-time high. They continue to be very high. Um, the, the sort of economics of development, which we'll be back later in the year to talk about as a broader CSA, um, are sort of working against us. And so that's something that we're obviously focused on. It is going to have an impact on us operationally as we st start to see those numbers slow. So, um, so this is, again, the importance of what we're looking at when we see these measures and we think about kind of how we're adapting our work um, and shifting across. So couple of new additions that I want to point out. So I know when we talk about this, we always talk about vacancy. It's uh, certainly a, a big uh, headline as we talk about impacts to our work. Um, the news is good. So what you'll see is we've added a vacancy dashboard to uh, the overall um, customer service charter. Um, it is trending down. So as a department, we're currently at 17% uh, of vacancy for the department, um, which we've been as high as, uh, we were getting close to 30% at one point. So we've made really significant strides. 
Uh, really want to call out Rachel for the work that she's done to really bring down vacancies in code. Our planning team continued to work really hard to reduce those vacancies. Um, and then Lisa's been doing a tremendous amount of work to reposition some of those critical vacancies in building. What you'll see is, is building still remains a, a challenge for us um, in a couple of key positions, both inspectors and associate engineers. They are critical positions to workflow for us, right? As you think about permits that do come through City Hall, um, they're going through our engineering team in, in plan review. Um, so having significant vacancies in that group is a challenge uh, and one that we're continuing to address. And then again, in, on inspection. So on average, we do about 180,000 inspections a year. Um, we have made some strides in hiring new inspectors over the last year. I'll tell you at this point last year, we were out about six weeks to get an inspection. Right now, we're sitting just under two weeks. Um, and again, so these are, and you've got to think these things move in flow, right? So this is peak time for inspection. Typically, this is when we see that long lead time. So holding it there at, uh, at that point is really a testament to the work that we've done and that Lisa's team has done uh, to really fill some of those gaps. Some of the key work that we're doing around uh, recruitment um, inside the department really focuses on that process. Uh, obviously, you know, city organization, getting people in the building is t uh, a lengthy process, it's a timely process. So we're trying to cut that down as much as possible. Um, we're actively tracking all of our recruitments, again, on a weekly basis. These are things that we do um, as just part of our regular check-ins. Um, we've really worked on our initial onboarding process as well to make sure that as soon as we get an employee in the door, we have a pathway for them to be successful through probation. Um, and then we're working with centralized HR on uh, actually centralizing all of our building recruitments uh, through the, the pilot for centralization there um, to see if we can get additional capacity. But we also know that recruitment's a double-edged sword. It's not just about how you get people in the building, it's about how you keep them in the building once you have them. Um, so again, there's a number of different things that we're doing from a departmental standpoint to really advance uh, retention within the department. Um, so again, uh, we have our policy and procedure hub. This is an effort to make sure that we're containing more of the institutional knowledge within the department by having a centralized repository where we can keep all of this information. And why that's critical um, from a recruitment standpoint is this becomes the backbone of our onboarding. It allows people to reference information and get sort of to the things that they need quickly and effectively. Um, we're working really closely with new employees as they come on board. Like I said, we're doing the 90-day checklist uh, to make sure that they ramp up very quickly, but then we're also checking in with those employees to sort of hear their concerns, address their needs, and make sure that they're feeling supported in their new position. Um, we are sort of, in addition to exit interviews, we're starting to work on uh, employee experience interviews as well. Um, to, again, just sort of really check in and understand what are the impacts that employees are having on working within the department so we have a better sense. And then uh, lastly, we're working on some pipeline activities. So we're working closely with San Jose State. Um, in this last budget, we had uh, funding for a planning fellowship. We're also actively working on an internship program. And we're starting to look at ways to expand that into other parts of the department to really sort of beef up that talent pipeline. So again, we're addressing those vacancies or we have a, a sort of a, a steady flow of folks coming into the department. So um, before I hand it over to the, the real experts in the room, um, a couple of key changes. So as you'll know, I always like to show you that big crazy dashboard with all those different charts on it. It's really confusing and really hard. When you go on the website, you can click on any single one of those and understand exactly what's going on. And when you do, it takes you to a page like this. And the key is not just about showing you the number, it's about explaining what it means. Not just to the public, not just to you as council members and stakeholders, but also to our staff and our managers so they can understand kind of what the impacts are within the department. So a couple of key things that we've changed since the last time we were here. We've added a much clearer goal description. So, uh, so you can see that dotted line across any measure. And it's not to say that this is where we're trying to get to, it's where we anticipate things should be at. Um, again, some of these measures are somewhat out of our control, it's dependent on the applicant, um, but it's good to get a benchmark of where we expect that number to be to show us sort of where we are um, and can understand uh, how best to, to approach it. And then secondly, we're really sort of working and drilling down on historic disruptions. Again, anybody should be able to go into this, look at it and understand what's going on. And part of that is looking back and being able to tell you, well, these are the key things that have happened on this timeline so you can understand kind of what happens in some of those charts. So like I said, across all 47 measures, you'll see uh, this page. Um, and so again, we're having the managers sort of in there really working on this data, working on these pages. So it's not just about making sure the public understands it, it's that we as a department really understand that as well. 
So with that, let us do a little deep dive uh, into a, a key select measures. Um, and I'm going to start with Rachel. Thank you, uh, Rachel Roberts, Deputy Director of Code Enforcement. Um, so today I'm highlighting three performance measures that are um, for our multiple housing program. Um, these include buildings inspected, units inspected, and violations closed. Um, so the um, measure you have before you is a building inspected. Um, so tracking and evaluating these measures is essential in ensuring we're achieving our mission um, of promoting and maintaining a safe and desirable living environment while also meeting our annual program targets and ensuring that we're providing the expected um, level of service that um, fees are paying for. Um, so as part of the, as you may know, as part of our three-tier model for the multiple housing program, buildings have to be inspected once every three, five, or six years, depending on the cycle they've been assigned. Um, and so with over 6,700 buildings in the program, we have to um, inspect at least 140 a month in order to ensure we're reaching um, that goal over each of the cycles. That equates to 17 buildings in our Tier 1 program, 50 in our Tier 2 program, and 73 buildings in our Tier 3 program. So it's really important that we're tracking um, how many buildings we're inspecting so that we can ensure we meet this goal um, of inspecting every building during their cycle. Um, so the buildings are... Um, the building inspected performance measure tells us you know, how we're doing each month, and then it gives us those insights and in, um, in understanding what might, factors might be helping or hindering us towards that progress. Um, and then we can make decisions um, based on those factors um, as far as um, resources we're allocating. Um, sometimes we shift um, inspections over to a tier three for a few months if that's what looks like what's needed, um, and we can adjust our operations accordingly. Um, so for this particular measure, you see a big increase um, between January and, and really June um, until it started kind of tapering off in July. And that's largely due to the increase in staffing. We were able to staff up that program and get people trained and moving um, and filling um, those vacancies and taking on those workloads. We hadn't been able to um, provide inspections in those areas with, you know, we had inspectors kind of covering more than one area for a while there. Um, we do see the drop in July, and that's mostly due to the fact that we did promote an inspector to a supervisor, and so we had a vacancy in that program again. Um, right now we have two vacancies still, and so we're, we're still not quite reaching that 140 a month goal, but it definitely will allow us to ensure we do by the end of the fiscal year that we've um, hit our target, or get as close to our target as possible. So for units inspected, um, this performance measure, we set a goal of inspecting um, the 600 it actually should say 680 units per month, so we'll correct that. Um, and this equates to 40 units per inspector. And um, we, we have the 40 units as a target um, because it, you know, it, it is what we have found uh, is probably the most manageable um, number of units that an inspector can provide services to. Um, we want to ensure that they can manage that workload so that they are able to provide the quality customer service and assist the customers in um, resolving those violations. Um, and this number can fluctuate because each building is different. Some of our buildings only have three units. Some of our buildings have 300 units. So it depends on the building they inspect um, as to how many units um, we might, we might um, you know, inspect in each month. But the goal is to do at least 40 per inspector, getting us to that 680 units per month. Um, if we, you know, do too many units, it, it, it can hinder our ability to provide that service. If we do too few, it could lead to a backlog, and, and then we're not um, reaching our targets for those, those tiers. So um, as seen with the building inspected um, measure, filling the staff vacancies between January and June really helped us to, um, to greatly increase our numbers around um, units inspected and, and working towards our goal. And then lastly here, we have our violations closed. Um, so, <clears throat> this measure tracks how many violations that were assessed um, during a multiple housing property inspection um, and, and how many of those have been corrected. Um, and so, this is really, really um, gets to the heart of our work because um, this is showing us, you know, um, how many of those issues, such as the missing smoke detectors, the unpermitted water heaters, our hazardous electrical wiring, dilapidated flooring, and so on, how many of these um, substandard housing violations that we identified have now been resolved and um, the property's now in compliance so that we can have better quality living um, units for our residents. Um, and so this program, um, you know, we inspect new buildings that come online and we also, you know, it also includes um, those buildings that are, could be 50, 60 years old. So it's really key to understanding the impact of a code enforcement work on the rental housing community and improving our, our housing overall. 
um, and ensuring that as um, you know, as time goes on, that we're maintaining the, our housing stock and ensuring that it's um, safe and quality um, housing um, now into the future. So, thank you. Good afternoon, Lisa Joyner, Deputy Director of the Building Division. So I'm going to talk about our uh, number of new projects with overdue cycles. So this measure gives us insight into the adequacy of our staffing levels within the plan review group related to the project submitted for review. And we have published timelines of when comments are to be sent based on project type. So you can see that at the end of 2022, we hit our peak of over 400 projects in the queue waiting for comments to be sent. We have difficulty filling open positions within the building plan review group, and in the last couple of years, we lost several staff members to retirements and, and other reasons, and we just haven't been able to get new staff in to fill that. So fortunately, at the end of 2022, we executed our new peak staffing contract, and we're able to bring on a few new companies that we didn't have before that, were, that are, have been able to give us significant capacity to help out. So you can see from our high of 420 some projects, we've gone down to we are under 100 projects overdue at this time. So in contrast to Rachel's where we want to see the numbers going up, we love to see that number diving down. Ideally, we would have zero projects overdue because that would mean our staffing levels are adequate for the projects that we're receiving. So as we monitor moving forward the projects that are coming in and ideally are able to bring more staff on board, we can see when to uh, back off on the peak staffing resources or when we need to re-engage them if we see that line moving back up so that we can meet our commitment of comments within our published timeline. And I am passing it on to our planning team now. Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon. Sylvia Doe, Division Manager with Planning's Permit Center team. Um, so for a bit of background, I know most folks uh, think of planning as a public hearing permit process. Uh, however, we also play a role at the building permit stage. Uh, so with building permits, planning reviews, building plans to ensure that those projects that were approved at the public hearing process by decision makers uh, are also matching what is submitted at the building permit stage. Um, in addition, for building permits that don't require a public hearing process, we also review those plans to ensure that whatever is being submitted matches what council approved zoning regulations are, such as maximum building heights and setbacks. Uh, so ever since we started tracking uh, planning process as part of the building permit stage, uh, since last August, uh, we had actually 100% uh, supervisor vacancy and a 30% planner one, two, three vacancy. Um, as of this past March, uh, we filled that planner uh, supervisor position. So now that it is 100% uh, staffed, um, and we also back in March filled one planner position. And I'm happy to report as of last week, we are now our planning permits and our team is 100% staffed. Um, so we expect to see our target performance to increase a little from an average of uh, completing about 70 conformance reviews of building permits each week um, and increasing that to our target of 80. Um, additionally, I do also want to add that while we are 100% uh, fully staffed on the Permit Center team for planning right now, uh, we do have two additional positions that will be coming online come November to reflect the actual building permit activity. Because um, as you can imagine, uh, over the past several years, a couple of uh, planning Permit Center positions were cut for budget reasons and we're slowly working towards um, filling up the team. Thank you. John too, <clears throat> division manager of the development review team. So I do deal with the ones that do go to public hearing. Um, one of the few things we do have control of is early on, early in the application. So one of this measure is, is a measure of our ability to provide comprehensive comment letters to development project Rogers that require public hearing. Typically these are larger, more complex projects. The comprehensive letter provides full comments from planning, but not only that team, but also public works, ESD, housing, parks, building, fire, and DOT. We want to provide an update to our CEQA document that they provided by our applicants. 
Identify and provide productive comment early on both allows the city and the applicant to gauge a timeline and promptly start addressing any comments and tackle on any documents or analysis that have long lead times. Typically in the last six months, we've been providing those comments at least 80% on time. In previous years, we've gone as low as 50% and we've gone as high as 94% recently. Using these measurements help gauges staff's caseload, locate any pinch points to either make process improvements or discuss with review partners. This number may fluctuate due to project intake and staffing resources. Currently, the department review team is fully staffed. As a result, we will maintain our target goal numbers. This measurement helps us make incremental modifications and use real-time accountability of our staff and to gauge and identify any quick issues, any issues quickly so that we can provide the best service possible and early on to our applicants. Uh, so I am very happy to report that in an effort to help our customers and our plan review team, we have launched a new best prepared designer program. We launched this in July. Um, initially, it, it was, well, it's for both licensed architects and engineers and unlicensed designers. But the unlicensed designers needed to attend a training first before they could enroll. And this training happened last Thursday. Um, I can speak to that. We had over 105, 150 registered people, and we had over 100 people actually show up to the training. Um, it, was, it was a really good training. There were lots of good questions, lots of, of things we can clarify for them. Um, since then, we've had over 30 licensed individuals enroll in the program. And since the Thursday training, over 20 people from the training have sent in their applications to enroll in the program. So I'm very excited to see how this, this moves forward. So again, the eligibility for the program is architects or engineers um, with three years of experience, certified access specialists, that are certified with state, and then unlicensed designers with three years of experience and completed the training we just had Thursday. And for the launch of the program, we are limiting it right now to single family projects with additions under 500 square feet, uh, patio covers, interior remodels, skylights, and foundation repairs, and then some small commercial projects such as cell sites, ADA upgrades, uh, gas station pump swaps, and signs. Um, so I believe we have three projects right now that are on the verge of being permitted. We had piloted about 50 through the program before the official launch. So I think this is going to be a very positive program for the community. And then another update on the building plan review is we are getting ready to launch SJE plans and SJ permit self start for the building division. Uh, so applicants will be able to go to our online portal at sjpermits.org and start their application online. They will book an intake appointment uh, with our staff. They will upload their plans through SJE plans. The permit intake appointment, they'll review, make sure everything's complete and correct and give them their fees. And then the project will be reviewed through the SJE plans program, which will provide much more visibility for the customers on where their project is in the review process. It'll save time for the permit intake and it's gonna streamline coordination between applicants and all the departments that need to review. Thank you. So just to wrap things up, um, you know, the, the big picture of everything that we've got going on really falls into three buckets. So it's, it's one, making sure that we have the people that we need and that they have the resources available to do the work they do. Two, it's to understand and measure both our processes, uh, our timelines, and those interactions with customers so we can adjust accordingly and make improvements when necessary. And then lastly, where we do have those challenges through process or through lack of people, is to implement near-term programs that help mitigate those process issues. So that, that things like the Best Prepared Designer Program as we move towards SJE uh, e plans, um, and then obviously the peak staffing to sort of fill that gap on the interim. And so overall, that's kind of giving us the capacity to continue to maintain a, a higher level of service. Obviously, we have a ways to go. Uh, we understand that. It's something that we continue to work towards. So with that, we're available for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I want to thank you, Chris and Rachel, Lisa, Sylvia, and John for all of your presentations. Really helpful. You're doing really good work, and it's really great to hear that two of your departments are fully staffed. 
that was really good news. I know, uh, and Rachel, you're working on it, but and close. That's good too. It, it's uh, <laughs> marvelous that we're down to 17 percent. And while the public may think that's a huge number, it is. But where we came from, it's quite a decrease, and that means we've been uh, strategic and targeting on how you're hiring people. And I'll, I'll get into my questions later, but I, I did just want to thank you for the, all the work and acknowledge the positive work that you've done so far. With that, let's go to members of the public, and then I'll go to the council or the committee. Paul Soto. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. What I'd like to see in this report is a, a quantification, a direct, accurate quantification from the planning department uh, detailing on a map exactly what properties are going to be used for that soft removal, because that should be, re that should be installed here. You're going to need more staff than you have now in order to make those kinds of assessments. You see, because what that is, is the planning department failing to do something facilitates the gentrification process. You see, doing something to a community doesn't necessarily mean that you, you're you physically like, like, like doing something ex like subje uh, objective. You can just sit there and not do anything and do something to my community, the Chicano community, the Mexicano community, okay? So you can harm us and fail in your responsibility through neglect. So I didn't hear much of that in here. You know, I heard a lot of bureaucratic language, but I didn't hear any real concrete policy decisions that are going to impact my community in December. You guys are going to start talking about this issue then, and I want to talk about it now. And we need a quantification of exactly who, because we know what the demograph is in those areas. We know who's going to be impacted, the poor, as always. You know, why is it that the hardest working people are also the poorest? Why is that? What kind of a disgusting society do we live in when the planning commissions and the planning departments are facilitating the process by which people are gentrified out of these areas? It's disgusting. It needs to stop. Because when you research Chris Burton's education, he's educated in authentics. He is educated in it. That's where he gets his knowledge from. And that is... Paul, I, I would appreciate you expert. not attacking our He's staff. He's an expert. He isn't attacking your staff by just... Blair? Hi. Blair Beekman here. Uh, I think it's okay to point out uh, staff policy making and such. That, that can be okay. I hope we can... Uh, uh, learn a subtlety to that uh, this fall in our practices at uh, public comment time. Uh, certainly not to hurt people's feelings, but to point out uh, information they said is it, important. Um, I wanted to thank yourselves for this okay. item. Uh, I'm hoping uh, Chairperson Foley uh, can go deeper into her uh, description of uh, what uh, we can look forward to in December. Paul Soto kind of mentioned it, I think, today that uh, you're going to be possibly working towards new budget review plans and, and tax plans in, in December. Is that my understanding? Because it would be nice to hear how items of December can relate to what you're talking about here at this time. Uh, uh, the uh, initial speaker, Chris, uh, I think he announced, uh, you know, that housing market things are a bit questionable still at this time and we're in a wait and see mode. That can be okay. Um, I, I really hope, you know, from our previous arguments uh, in the springtime about the future of uh, housing issues, we really can balance the questions of what uh, middle income housing development can offer. And that as much as we like uh, market rate housing, middle income housing, I think can offer an interesting flexibility and ways to really move forward in development that uh, it, can, it can offer both market rate housing and low income housing ideas. Uh, where people, and, and mixed income ideas, most important of all, uh, that uh, middle income can be really good with uh, for local neighborhoods. From that, this item uh, very nicely mentioned uh, small cell work that you're going to be doing also. Good luck in uh, cell installment. I think we should be pressing openness and accountability and that 
uh, the public can. Back to the committee. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the public comments. Moving on to Council Member Batra. Thank you very much for giving us a complete rundown on the opportunity you have taken where things had fallen behind to apply technology, innovation, and come up with the streamlined processes which are going to have an excellent outcome for our community. And your work ranges from trying to see how the plumbing is broken to creating a new division or multiple buildings. So the range is extensive. Skills required to do your jobs are extensive. So I'm really glad that you have now found a way to fill the vacancies, at least in some areas. 17% is still a large number, but you made a tremendous progress in that. PBC work, the one which I get most talked about from the community, and so-called complaints, now you're gonna turn them into compliments because you're cutting down the time where it's going to take three to five days to give a permit versus waiting for months. And those are the big, not only irritants to the people that they can't improve their kitchen or they can't add a small room to their house, especially during the pandemic. It's also economic activity the contractors are not able to get their job done, and hence we lose, people are losing employment activity with that, the contractors are losing the money on that one. So you are gonna help with this program which you just started, the Best Prepared Designer Program, I think is going to bring a lot of customer satisfaction, and hopefully our inboxes are gonna be filled with lots of compliments. And I'm looking forward to that one. I'm gonna give as much promotion as I can to this program through my newsletters and my talks with the people because this is a really application of technology and innovative ideas, okay? You're shifting the responsibility of a good design back to where it belongs, okay? Because those architects and all, they need to earn their money to bring us valid designs. And I think they are prepared for it. In fact, I had received that request soon after I joined. Uh, one of the architects, uh, friends of the winery, that's what they told me, that they wanted this responsibility. I'm glad that you've given it. So I appreciate all the work you have done, and I'm sure that this council will be receiving a lot of thanks for this work which you are doing. And I wish you good luck in completing and hiring the rest of the staff. I did meet three of the retirees from the PBCE uh, at the concerts in the Greystone Park. And I literally, with no exaggeration, I lean on my knees and I had both my hands folded, asked them to if they will join your department at least on a part-time basis. <laughs> okay, those retirees could come back. I think one of them started leaning in that direction. The others two, I don't think they took my suggestion <laughs> to anywhere. But I hope they contact you, all the three of them, and give you some time to do that. Thank you very much for the report, and good luck. I really like what you have done here. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Ortiz. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank uh, PPCE uh, for their great presentation. Really excited about all the work you are doing, especially the Best Prepared Designer program, as we have many frequent flyers uh, who come through the City Hall process and have demonstrated their commitment to following the rules and, and producing quality, quality projects. I'm sure that this program will lessen a load on the department, hopefully, uh, and help get us where we want to be uh, department-wide. Um, as I continue to build relationships in my district, uh, especially with small businesses, there's a major theme that uh, arises 
uh, with issues with permitting um, for changes at their businesses, most, most specifically restaurants. Um, they tell me that for permits for patio extensions, fixture upgrades, and uh, other extensions, it, it could take up to months, um, which could cost small businesses their livelihood. Is there any thought of putting together uh, an innovative process for these type of concerns? Thank you, council member. So we do have a streamlined restaurant program, mm. um, especially if you're hearing this from restaurant owners, um, yes. if they need help with permitting. Um, and I can definitely send you and, excuse me, all the council members the information on it um, to put them in touch with our small business allies who help us run that. Great. No, I love to learn more about that and send that because yeah uh, last week I've spoken to a few um, small businesses who are experiencing issues and, and having to wait a few months so I'll, I'll be sure to connect with them thank you thank you councilmember Batra there's so much interest in your work and the progress I know you bring this report uh, every six months. I don't want to increase your work, <laughs> but because the public interest and, and our desire to highlight so that the public can see what is coming, I would request if there is a way to get this report every quarter. I don't know, Ch uh, Chairperson, how we do that. Uh, at least some kind of an update. I know you'll have a dashboard which will give information, but it would be great if we, uh, we could have a report here uh, every quarter. Council Member Batra, I'm going to say no <laughs> because we have a work plan in place that every, every month it's strategically set out to what we'll be covering in CED. So if we added this to the work plan, it would decrease amount of attention that we give to another item that's coming up that particular month. And I know that when I meet with uh, Chris and his team one-on-one, -on -one, I'm always given an update as to what's happening in my district and in the city at that time. So I know the reports are out there and available, but to have it received at this committee as a formal report, I think that would be a difficult for us to accomplish within our committee work structure. Chris, yeah. do you want to comment about that? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Council Member. I, I, uh, I, I do always err away from uh, bringing more reports to committee, as much as we love to be here. Um, there's a lot of time and effort that goes into it, but I, I acknowledge the point and uh, certainly one that we take seriously about how do we actually get the message out there. Um, within uh, the, the management framework we have within the department, a key part of, of really sort of delivering on all these promises is ensuring that we're telling our story effectively um, so that the public knows, because so much of, of our business sort of revolves around perception. Um, people hear a story and they tell everybody else how awful it is, right? And it's always the, the one bad experience versus the nine not so bad experiences or good experiences that everybody hears. So, um, so we're committed to ensuring that our customers and the public more broadly have awareness of the things we're doing. Um, that's why we made the dashboard completely public. Um, it's on our website. You go to the About Us section on PBCE and you can see it right there. And we do also publish um, our own newsletter. So I think it's something that we need to take on and really talk to you as council officers about and how we kind of carve out space within that to give more regular updates uh, on the go uh, of the work that's going on and, and kind of where performance stands. Thank you. So Chairperson, I was, I'm totally in sync with the work which happens in my district in my monthly updates, I get those and I get some special updates in addition to that. I was only trying to ask for this report, so I wanted to highlight the great work being done to the public. And now uh, I understand we don't want to increase the work on them, so we'll find other ways to highlight the activity which is going on. So, so I accept that, uh, that you would do and uh, I'd like to make a motion to, I move to accept the staff recommendation. The report. The yeah, status the, report. The report. Status report. I'll okay. second that. Great. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. 
Vice Mayor Kamei, you removed your hand. Was that to make the motion? Yes. Okay, very good. Then let's vote. Okay, that motion carries as well. Wonderful. Let's move on to the next report from your department. I'm going to Citywide Planning Activity Semi-Annual Status Report. I'm going to seamlessly transition as we switch our teams here. <laughs> um, so the one dashboard you didn't get to see or we didn't talk about in detail is we actually have a citywide planning dashboard that talks yeah. about all of the broader policy work that's going on within the planning division, uh, led by Michael and Martina and Ruth, who are here, to walk through that and give you more details on, on where we're at. Uh, thank you, committee members. I'm very happy to be here. I'm Martina Davis. I'm a division manager with our citywide planning group. I'm joined by Michael Brio, our deputy director, and Ruth Cueto, uh, one of our principal planners. So, yes, as Chris mentioned, we held off on showing you our part of the customer service charter until now. So um, when you look at our dashboard, this is what it's going to look like. So what you'll see here on the right, it's a little bit different from everyone else because you know we don't have permits in the same way others do. Um, we don't have kind of product in, product out. Our work can vary just drastically based on what it is and has uh, very varying deadlines. Um, nothing's really standardized with what we do. So um, what we decided to present it as, as really our, our staff is our resource here. So how do we look at our workload versus our staffing and timelines? So you'll see on the right a list, and if you go on the live version, it scrolls down. It's quite a long list of everything um, that's on our plate right now on the citywide planning team, from the really exciting stuff, Five Wounds Urban Village update, to the mundane uh, random data requests from reporters, for example. Uh, we did want to include everything because we realized that when you start focusing on just the big stuff, you lose track of the million little things that we do that add up. So that's our list of what we've got going on. Everything is organized as either active, which means we are actively working on it. Committed means that it's an upcoming project where we have the resources identified and a start date identified. Backlog means it's something on our plate, but at the moment we do not have um, a start date or the workload, or excuse me, staffing identified. And then on hold are projects that are on hold for various reasons, sometimes um, reasons in our control, sometimes reasons outside of our control. Each project is assigned a value called FTE, stands for full-time equivalent. Um, in short, it's basically the number of people you would need to get it done in the time frame we anticipate doing it. So for example, if we're gonna say uh, the capital Caltrain plan on our back end, it'll have a start date and an end date to get it done in that time, we think it needs 1.4 staff working on it. <laughs> so then we add that all up and we say, well, what do we have staffing versus workload? my next slide so you see what we've got right now we have 18 full-time city staff we're augmented by two peak staffing planning consultants and our so it comes to 20 our workload of active projects is 20.4 which means we're either working extra hours or um, timelines are starting to slip a little bit or potentially a combination of both keep our eye on it um, you see we have 4.4 people's worth of backlog projects, 2.4 staff worth of committed projects, and 1.7 staff worth of projects on hold. And definitely this is a dynamic document. Um, we're updating it constantly. We use it as a tool for ourselves, so definitely feel free to check out the latest version. Um, it will always be updated. With that, I will move into our just team composition, and I have such great news here um, about our staffing. So last time I was here at this committee in February, we shared that we had about 40% vacancy on our team, and that had been 40 to 50% for well over a year at that point. We are down to all but three staff positions are filled, 9.5% vacancy, and of those three, two of them We've made offers, staff has accepted offers, and they're in the background process. So I really wish that it could have been done so I could have counted that today, but we're very close. And then the last one is a supervising planner on our housing team. Um, that's, that recruitment is underway. I believe the job posting just closed and we'll be, uh, we'll be evaluating the candidates. 
So we have changed our composition a little bit since we talked to you last as part of the hiring. We brought on two principal planner positions, Ruth being one of them. Jared Ferguson, formerly of uh, Economic Development and Cultural Affairs, joined us also as a principal planner. He is on our housing team, so I wanna highlight that. Um, we made a little bit of changes to that team just so we could have a whole group principal planner on down focusing on housing policy. So we will have a principal planner, a supervising planner, and two planners um, just really focused on that. We've moved the destination home uh, planner to a different team where it fits very well so that we can just really focus on our housing policy. And I do wanna take an opportunity too to just do an overall shout out to staff. Um, I'm here presenting, but it's the staff who does the hard work. And I think between both the staff we've had stick with us and the new staff, we have a really, really great group. So I'm very excited about that. And those who are listening, I just wanna say thank you. All right, so I'll jump right in. I'll start out with uh, updates per team. So first one, another very exciting urban villages. As of February, we had nobody on the urban village team. Now we have three very, very capable staff members, uh, which means we've been able to resume urban village work. Um, the first one I'll talk about very briefly, Alum Rock East Urban Village. That is uh, planning that urban village on Alum Rock East of 680. We are in the process to secure a planning consultant for that. Um, that one does have some federal money attached to a grant we have, so it's a little bit more of a federally compliant process, adds a couple more steps, but um, we are in progress with that. We anticipate having a consultant on board by the end of the year, and we'll be getting work early next year on Allen Rock East Urban Village. Next one will be actually your next presentation today, so I'm not really gonna talk about it other than to just quick highlight the similar process for um, selecting a consultant. That's where we're at now. We're beginning that process. It'll be a little bit easier consultant selecting process because no federal money. And similarly, we expect to begin work in 2024, and you will find out more about that in a moment. Next one is station area planning. We're still working on our five wounds urban village plan update. It's a big one. It's the merger and update of four urban village plans um, in proximity of the future 28th Street Little Portugal BART station. We're working very closely with our Department of Transportation and the VTA on this project. Um, it's including extensive multilingual community outreach. As of now, we've completed two out of our five planned workshops. Our next workshop is gonna be on September 21st, and then um, we'll just keep working on this, and we anticipate council consideration probably late summer 2024. Uh, we do anticipate having to do an environmental impact report, so that's a part of that timeline there. Capital Caltrain Station Area Plan is kind of in its finishing up stage. Um, so it's 16 acres along Monterey Highway near the Capital Caltrain Station. Um, kind of, you know, where Capital and Monterey intersect. We've completed the two community workshops uh, in 2021. We had kind of an introductory, let's talk about the area, um, opportunities and constraints. And then in, uh, earlier this spring, we had a um, shared art, the draft plan and got some feedback. So we're finalizing that draft plan and we anticipate having that to council by the end of the year. Final one I'll talk about before passing it along is our ordinance and policy team. Um, one accomplishment we've had since February is we finished the updates to the cannabis business ordinance. We've now had three businesses um, find new locations and secure zoning verification certificates. So their next step would be building permits and um, opening. So that's, that's been exciting. We're also working with the Equity Academy to just help educate those groups on the zoning and what they can expect when they make it through. Major body of work on this team is our Coyote Valley Corridor Study that is studying and proposing new uses on the properties on the east side of Monterey, between Monterey and Coyote Creek, kind of throughout Coyote Valley, so from just Metcalf basically to the border of Morgan Hill. We have selected a consultant place works. They have begun work on that. Um, we have started public outreach, so we've had a number of focus groups with various in interested parties, um, owners, environmental advocates, et cetera. And actually tonight will be our first uh, broader community meeting to just introduce the consultant and the project to the public and start getting input. So that will be a hybrid meeting. I think our team's first hybrid meeting, so please wish us luck with that. Um, and we do anticipate that 
uh, you know, that's going to have a quite extensive environmental review process given the environmental sensitivity in that area. So that's going to take us likely through 2024 and get to council near the end of 2024. Highlighting very quickly some other upcoming items that we're working on. Um, we have some mandatory housing element zoning updates. We have to update our ADU ordinance to address more recent state law changes, as well as we have to allow farm worker housing on agriculturally zoned land that we will be bringing to council this fall. We are also just working on um, that update to the billboard policy per prior council direction. We'll be increasing the number of digital billboards that will have to be removed, or excuse me, static billboards that would have to be removed in order to install a digital billboard. And um, we're tracking that with some of the other billboard work that uh, OEDCA is doing and anticipate that coming to council in the spring. We are working on securing a consultant for the Senate Bill 9 and Opportunity Housing Zoning Update. So that's just kind of re-looking at and potentially expanding our SB 9 rules so that we can allow uh, more types of these small infill projects in residential neighborhoods. And then finally, we are um, trying to uh, figure out how we are going to um, staff. We're just looking at some options, our neighborhood business district ordinance update. Council gave us direction through the general plan amendment cycle, I believe last year, to allow housing in three of our neighborhood business districts, Japantown, 13th Street, and, uh, shoot, what was that? Lincoln think, no, I know, I almost Lincoln said Willow. Lincoln Avenue. Lincoln Avenue, thank you. I almost said Willow, it is not Willow. Um, so we'll be working on that as soon as we're, we identify our, our staffing for, for that one. Thanks, Martina. Um, our Climate Smart team recently wrapped up years long work on the city's parking and transportation demand ordinance. As you may recall, last December, City Council adopted staff's recommendation to update the parking ordinance to no longer have minimum parking requirements for development proposals, and that ordinance went into effect um, in April of this year. So the current work on the team's plan includes um, an update to the REACH code specifically on um, electric vehicle charging stations and multifamily developments. Um, and that's evaluating changes to the minimum requirements of, uh, for change charging stations and outlets in those development proposals. Um, that is expected to go to city council in November. And the remainder of the work would be on um, reviewing the distributed energy resources exemption that was adopted by council a few weeks ago and it's set for city council in December of this year. Okay. The general plan team is evaluating two privately initiated general plan amendment applications and also working on one city initiated application to protect small business uh, small businesses from displacement. Community meetings for these applications are tentatively scheduled for September and hearings in November and December to Planning Commission and City Council. Also, uh, moving forward, all general plan amendment applications will require the submittal of, develop of a development permit application as well. And uh, beginning next year, uh, the team will start work on state mandated changes to both the safety and uh, open space elements of the general plan, as well as creating a new element focused on environmental justice. The citywide team or special projects team, I don't know if we have any, we went with that name now. <laughs> um, they're continuing their work on aligning the zoning with the general plan. This work is mandated by a state bill 1333 which requires charter cities such as San Jose to make zoning consistent with the general plan land use designation. And we have approximately 12,000 properties left to align. Staff will bring 650 of those properties to city council in October for realignment and the remaining balance will be completed in 2024. And other citywide planning work includes um, that same team is also working on mobile home park general plan and zoning changes as directed by council. This first batch uh, to reach council for these changes are the most at risk. The remaining parks are scheduled for spring of next year. And lastly, our destination home planner has been quite busy this year issuing five permits for 965 units since uh, February. 
These are 100% affordable developments where um, at least one third of the units are dedicated to permanent supportive housing or extremely low income ho uh, households. And that is it for Citywide. Michael Brio, I'm pinch hitting for um, Jared who's um, celebrating his parents' retirement right now is on vacation. Um, so uh, in terms of the housing, I think you all know the big item that we c accomplished was the council approved the housing element on uh, June 20th of 2023. Um, going forward, our work is really uh, uh, about all those action items you see in the housing catalyst work program. Won't get into that too much already. That actually just item just went to council at last week. But that really will be uh, most of our work going forward. Um, I will just note that um, it was already mentioned by Martina, but we have Jared as a new principal planner, obviously, and we have um, two two planning positions underneath him, one of which is currently recently filled and one will be filled in the coming weeks. And we still have a senior planner to replace Ruth. Um, and we are, as uh, mentioned by Martina, that recruitment is actually underway now. Next slide. Oh. Um, so some of our current work items um, related to housing are uh, are creating a um, a uh, an ordinance and policy framework to allow and and facilitate additional housing in North San Jose, particularly affordable housing and mixed income housing. Um, that item that 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 uh, body of work will be coming to council in December of 2023. Um, preceded by planning commission in November. We're gonna be having community meetings in September, October on this. And just a reminder, this is one of our key work items in our housing element, and it needs to be completed um, by January 31st of 2024 for um, the, the guidance of HCD and our housing element. So that one is, a, is, a, is one that will be coming in December. The other one, which we touched upon uh, a number of times, is the cost of development. This will be an annual report that we give to council so they can understand the market conditions as it relates to housing in San Jose. Um, we will be bringing that cost of development um, report to council on October 26th and as part of a study session. And then again, uh, much of the work of this team will be focused on implementing many of those action items that are in the housing element. Not all of them are on our plate. Many of them are in the housing department, but at least half are within um, the housing team's purview and responsibility. Some other city planning work that's kind of, uh, that's being done on, by various teams is, the Evergreen East Hills development policy, um, we're, effect we're amending that policy, we're effectively retiring it or proposing to retire it for new development going forward per council direction. Mm -hmm. um, this needs to be done to uh, allow uh, pending development to move forward. We're anticipating bringing that to council at the end of October of this year. The other one, if you recall, is the Pleasant Hill Golf Course. There's interest in redeveloping that closed golf course. We were given direction by council to initiate a process, a high level process to identify um, guiding principles for that site if and when it redevelop, redevelops. Um, we are in the process of selecting consultants. We received two bids as of Friday and we will be reviewing them. We anticipate having consultants on board in early October and our goal is to have our first community workshop in early December of this year. And that concludes the citywide planning activity status report, and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to see things like the urban village and particularly the mobile home parks on this report and having the timeline uh, attached to it. Before I go to the committee, I'll go to members of the public. Do we have any public comments? Paul Soto. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. That report simply outlines how inadequate, how incompetent, and how intentional the planning department is working with the planning commission and all of these other systems to convolute the process so much that nobody can identify specifically what you're doing 
to the Chicano and Mexicano communities in the city. And what you were doing is you were gentrifying our communities out. And when you're listen, when I'm listening to you, you are not, you are using euphemistic language. Everything that I'm hearing is what evil sounds like because it's intentional. And the intention is get all of the descendants of the cannery workers, get all of the descendants of the farm workers, get all of the descendants of the Chicano movement, get them out of here. Because we, through the redlining process, which happened in the Planning Commission, that's who generated the documents. The generation of those redlining documents came out of the Planning Commission and came out of the Planning Department. So you guys know what you've done to our city and you've created systems of poverty. And what I heard right now is the process by which that was accomplished. So now with that said, I want a direct analysis of redlining's impact and how you guys do not address that. And you want to talk about an attack? You already know for a fact what you did. I was put in handcuffs no more than two hours ago while I was advocating. I can't wait to public comment. You sit your dogs on me again and you're gonna- Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, boy, uh, boy, we can hear. And sorry to hear uh, what Paul is going through. I would like to hear what he has to say at open forum time. Uh, good luck. I was going to try to say, uh, to try to help the situation that it's still August and that, you know, we're a bit new coming back to the process. Uh, good luck how we can better talk about these things uh, come September and October. Uh, I think we'll be more prepared to offer more in-depth uh, conversation, which is important uh, and always nice and helpful and, and good luck in those efforts. Uh, for myself in this item, um, I think what uh, caught my attention was, oh boy, I got ambulances coming by, sorry. Uh, what caught my attention with this item is uh, the future of the, uh, you'll be, the, uh, what is it, the digital billboards will be coming in uh, April or into the springtime of next year. Well, at least in the very least that you'll be taking down previous billboards uh, that were, you know, I guess as a part of the uh, planning uh, to put up new digital billboards and just uh, that was planned to be taken down. A reminder that, uh, you know, as much blight as the old billboards can have, um, you know, replacing them with new digital billboards is not that much of a deal, I don't think. Uh, I think we have to be really cautious and really ask that the future of digital billboards uh, be confined to the airport area and not moved into the downtown area. Uh, I hope this fall that can be a very uh, good, healthy discussion, because I think, I hope by this fall we can come to realize that uh, a whole bunch of agencies collecting data on people is not that innovative, you know. It's uh, so they're going to make a ton of money and, and 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 rip off a bunch of people and possibly use it for law enforcement purposes. That's Back to the committee. Thank you. Uh, seeing no hands from the council, I will ask a question or just make a statement. Looks like you're you mentioned Martina. I think having a hybrid meeting with Coyote Valley. Uh, we've been getting a lot of emails about that, uh, lobbying us, and it was just a commuting committee meeting or a community meeting. So I look forward to hearing the report from that after you've met and, and done your research. I know that will come to council at some point. Uh, also, I want to encourage you that don't be scared of a hybrid meeting. They work really, really well. Um, with that, I will entertain uh, Vice Mayor Kamei. Thank you so much. I'd like to sta thank the staff for the report, and I'd like to move acceptance of uh, the staff report. Second. Great. Thank you. Seeing no other hands, let's vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Thank you so much. Some of you may be staying. Others of you may be leaving. Next report is the Market Ready Urban Village Status Report.
So while they're getting set up, I'll just note that um, if you recall that the uh, as part of the uh, four-year re review process, we were given direction from council to put together a budget request on um, completing urban village plans that were primed, given uh, had prime, uh, were market ready, so to speak, where the market factors were such that we could expect market rate housing to be built in the near term. And so last budget year, or two budget years ago, we got $400,000 to complete such a planning process. And then we got, I think it was an additional 300,000 just recently in this previous budget cycle to do an EIR for that um, urban village. So it combined $700,000. So then the question was, well, which urban village, which is the market ready urban village that we are going to initiate? And Eugene um, and Jose are going to present our, our um, the direction that we're going and the analysis that backs that up. I just want to note that um, Eugene will be doing this presentation. Um, he's fairly new, and um, so I really he's do, done great work. And uh, he came to us from UC Berkeley, a graduate program. And then we have Jose, who is his supervising planner, backing him up. So they've both been a, a great addition. They are. Um, three, uh, two of the three urban village planning team that we now have that we didn't have um, six months ago. So we're really excited to have them working on this stuff. And I'll turn it over to you, Eugene. Thank you, Michael. Welcome to both of you. And uh, we'll be kind, we promise. <laughs> well, I appreciate the introduction, Michael. Um, and I might uh, repeat some of what he said just for context. So, you know, please uh, forgive me for that. But uh, good afternoon, committee members. Um, you know, like Michael said, we're, today we'll be presenting a status update on the West San Jose Urban Villages Market Study. Um, my name is Eugene Lau, planner of Citywide Team as part of PPCE with Jose Rano, supervising planner. Um, we, ha we also had a lot of help from a lot of various departments as well. So I want to start by sharing some context on what brought us to begin this market study. Uh, first in 2019. A cost development study identified four urban villages, South Dianza, Basile de Saratoga, Saratoga Avenue, and South Bascom Avenue South as urban villages with near-term potential for market rate development. Then in 2021, City Council directed staff to return to Council through the budget process with a proposed resource allocation for the creation of a priority urban village with respect to housing opportunity and market demand. In 2022, another cost development study reaffirmed West San Jose. And then it brings us here today in 2023, we're sharing our findings on which urban village to proceed with and to start a planning process this year. Here are our four urban villages that I just mentioned in context with the other growth areas in San Jose. During our analysis, we found that it made sense to bring the two Saratoga urban villages together and we would combine the two if we chose it for a plan. And for South Dianza, there was potential to expand the border to the south to bridge the communities across Norman Y Mineta Freeway. Here's what that expansion would look like, along with updated numbers on land size, parcel count, and address count. Here is our analysis uh, structured as follows. We took an initial look at relevant existing conditions, and then took a deeper look into opportunity sites in each urban village gauge potential displacement risk for existing residents, and a look into market data and past development interests in the urban villages, followed by our staff recommendation. So moving into our first area of analysis, opportunity sites. Our methodology cites the following opportunities and constraints. Constraints being existing residential, including affordable housing, if there is a school on site, if it's a historic resource, if it's a site of a public utility or building, or are there any uh, currently titled projects on site. For opportunity, we consider sites above uh, 0.5 acres, if the development is built before the year 2000, and a likeliness to be developed metric based on an assessor data of land value over improvement value, meaning that the land is worth more than what is currently on site. And let me uh, share our key takeaways for each urban village. So first, let's take a look at South De Anza. There are 38 opportunity sites with a split of 13 being an acre or larger and 25 being half to one acre. Of 237 active businesses, there are 72 small businesses and 27 opportunity sites more likely to be developed. There are 23 small businesses in those sites. Now let's take a look at Saratoga. 
There are 67 opportunity sites with a split of 26 being an acre or larger and 41 being half to one acre. Of 591 active businesses, there are 54 small businesses in total and 37 opportunity sites more likely to be developed. There are 25 small businesses in those sites. And lastly, let's take a look at South Bascom Avenue South. There are 23 opportunity sites with a split of eight being an acre or larger and 15 between half to one acre. Of 150 active businesses, there are 56 small businesses and 15 opportunity sites more likely to be developed. There are 25 businesses in those sites. So looking at the three that we considered here, um, staff ranks Saratoga first, given it has the highest number of opportunity sites, higher number of sites more likely to be developed, and a similar number of small businesses in those sites overall. Moving into our next category of analysis, existing residential displacement. Um, our data is consisting of 2016 to 2021 five-year American Community Survey block group data um, from the, uh, the census. I know that's a, that's a lot of words. <laughs> We based our analysis on previous work uh, from uh, urban villages and considered median income, rent burden, housing tenure, and racial makeup in our, in our analysis. This is typically how studies assess residential displacement risks, and it's consistent with the city's citywide residential anti-displacement strategy. South De Anza overall has the highest income and is the least rent burden. South Bascom Avenue South is the most rent burden overall with the least overall incomes and Saratoga is right in the middle. Along with the other indicators such as tenure and racial makeup, South De Anza is the least likely to experience residential displacement given new development as a result of the approved urban village plan. Next, we're looking at commercial multifamily market rents and permit history to see which urban village would have the highest rents to support new development and to gauge past development interests. We looked at CoStar data CoStar is a real estate data repository as part of our analysis, as, and as part of our analysis across a 10-year span. And we also looked at city permit data as well. Uh, summar summarizing the data, South De Anza commands the highest commercial rents and multifamily rents across those 10 years between 2013 and 2023, followed by Saratoga and South Bascom Avenue South. Saratoga takes a slight edge over Bascom um, regarding rents. And looking at that CoStar data, we found that South De Anza commands the highest overall commercial rents per square foot across that mentioned 10-year span, as you can see here. Um, and then the case is the same for multifamily rents as well. So shown in the, uh, the figure here are one-bedroom rents, but it's the same for apartment sizes from studios to three bedrooms across that 10-year span. And now let's look at uh, development-related permits in the last in the past five years. So there are four developments in South De Anza, three approved hotel developments and one memory care facility under construction. There are four in Saratoga, one commercial building, in addition to Westgate Shopping Center and two larger mixed use developments. And then three in South Bascom Avenue South, one mixed use building, one residential care facility and one daycare center. So taking everything together, higher rents and a pattern of development interest usually suggests a better likelihood for developments to be able to be financed. Um, so in that ranking, South De Anza would be the rank highest, in this case, followed by Saratoga and South Bascom Avenue South, given that 10-year uh, pattern of higher rents in South De Anza from 2013 to 2023. Here is our initial recommendations. Um, and taking a look at our final rankings again with each category of analysis that I mentioned. So staff ultimately prioritized the highest number of opportunity sites without constraints, supportable rents for development, and less potential for existing residential displacement. And given this analysis, we are selecting Saratoga as our next UV that we'll start a plan process for. Our next steps following this status update is to develop the RFP and consult in scope and budget onboard a lead consultant and begin the plan process which we expect to start winter 2023 and or early 2024. And we're happy to answer any questions.
Thank you for the rep that report, Eugene. That was fabulous. Really interesting information. I was hoping that South Bascom would win out in your analysis, but I understand that this was all done economically uh, or with an economic impact and in, in data. So uh, I understand this will likely help Council District 1 but and have some intrinsic value for the other districts. Um, so I, I will go to members of the public and turn to the committee afterwards. Thank you. Paul? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe, and I do not say this very often, but that was an excellent report. Thank you for compiling it and the way that you delivered it, because it was excellent in terms of what I needed to know for my advocacy. So thank you. Well, I'd like to highlight the fact that the analysis pointed out that there are certain communities that are least likely to be displaced because of their income. So by making that statement, he also made the inverse true, factual. He didn't state it, but it means that the inverse is also factual. That means, and what I mean by that, is that the communities that are least capable of have absolutely no defense, no defense. Our only defense is for our elected leaders to exercise the power that we as the people endowed them with to stop it, to put a stop. It means death. That means that's your neglect to stop the process of gentrification means literal death. And death via poverty is slow. I don't know if you've seen somebody die of poverty. I have directly. And it's a slow process. First, it takes your mind. Then it takes your spirit and your emotions. And then it destroys the body. It's slow and disgusting. Something needs to be done about it. These areas that are outlined are the profiteers from the red line. They made their areas exclusive and protected it. That can no longer be tolerated. What I want is I want a 50% cap on market rate housing. Right now, you can do it, you have the power. 50% cap on all market rate housing and a 1% tax on all the equity in the red line districts. Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, you've been talking about urban village issues uh, kind of frequently at agenda items this past couple of weeks here in August. So thank you. After all this time, I'm, I'm hopefully I can finally get ready to start to talk more about, um, you know, a few years ago in the past few years, uh, you know, after the COVID things were happening, um, a lot of new funding was coming in, dollars were going to urban village developers fairly easily. You know, I felt it was really important at that time to describe, uh, you know, that those developers, when they get those dollars, I mean, it, it really, we should be considering how lower income uh, things can be established for urban village things. And that we maybe shouldn't be giving those sorts of dollars to uh, urban village developers overall. And if, they, and if we do, we should really be asking them to want to look into the importance of uh, real low income housing ideas as part of the urban village process, as part of the ways to develop, uh, I guess, you know, mixed income ideas that, uh, we have to learn to be talking about at some point, and that uh, could be a real good example for the urban village situation. Um, so, uh, yeah, just to mention that and and uh, in ways that doesn't game the system. That's what I'm trying to ask about at this time, the ways that we can do it really well. Uh, good luck how the future of funding can work that can really respect uh, low income housing in the future. Thank you. Back to the committee. Vice Mayor Kamei. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted um, to, uh, to have you here. Uh, and uh, I appreciate um, uh, all the work that we're going to do in the future. Uh, this is something that I you know, had been uh, looking at for quite some time. And I do know that I was in competition with my uh, lovely 
uh, colleague here, uh, but, uh, but I, I, I said, okay, we gotta let the process happen. And, uh, and so um, I thank you for your information. I think that's, that, it, that informs a lot of different things and it gives me a better understanding of, of what, uh, what occurs. Um, I wanted to know, I know that there have been several ur urban villages already that have you know, come through. There's one that's in, you know, there are some in process and that this one is really early because you haven't even done the RFP or anything like that. Um, how do you take what you have learned from previous urban villages and try to incorporate them into the one that either you're working on or the one that you're going to work on and, and all of that? Because I think that, that in, and I understand that there are differences between the communities, between the different types of businesses and all of that. But um, I, I think that that's important, and I was just wondering how that gets done. Um, yeah, so I mean, we definitely, I think, you know, council gave us direction. Uh, one of the directions we've gotten uh, at various points is how do we streamline the actual process? So I think that that's a balancing act, right? Because there's democracy, which is not typically streamlined. Um, and then there's, but there's also a desire to get these done much uh, ex, uh, efficiently so we don't take many, many years to get them done. So we're exploring that. I think on the one side of what we've learned is that a lot of the planning documents themselves, the scope of work is a lot larger than it needs to be in terms of the content and the document. And we really need to focus on what are the core issues that the, that the urban village plan is intended to deal with, which is land use and development. And to some extent, public services like um, you know streets and streetscapes and parks, but there are some core issues. Let's focus on those. Let's make it a really usable document um, so that it, it's, it's, very, it, it's very easy to implement for the planners and the developers. So that's one aspect. The other thing we're kind of learning is, out, and the outreach really is gonna vary by community. So it really depends on the community. And I think you have to respect the, the unique qualities of that community and the desires of that community. But um, one example that we've looked at is looking at five wounds as an example of how, at least when you really need to do deep outreach with multiple languages, of how that can work. In other communities, they don't have told us they don't want as much deep outreach, they just wanna get the plan done. So I think that's gonna be a unique ask, aspect that we have to sort of adapt to a given area. But the sort of scope of the plan and how much and what we address in the plan, I think we're really looking at skinning that down to make it a much simpler document and at least the de process of developing the plan will um, be a lot simpler as well. The other thing I think we've really learned, and this, we, we had our hands tied on this one, is that there were, um, there were policies in the general plan that came was it was actually direction approved by council. It was actually coming from Ma former Mayor Chuck Reed and then it was approved by council that really tied our hands in terms of planning for housing and jobs separately in an urban village. What we've learned is that it oftentimes makes sense and state law has reinforced this in many ways to plan for where you want the housing and where you want um, the jobs or the employment or the commercial. Now there are cases where mixed use makes sense but not necessarily everywhere. So there were changes made by the council where they unwound some of those rules. We have a lot more flexibility now to sort of plan for, let's put the employment here, let's put the housing here, and maybe it makes mixed use make sense at this intersection. Um, so that's another sort of lesson learned. Um, yeah. That's, that's wonderful. I, I am really looking forward to this. I know it's a lot of work, but um, like I said, I'm delighted that you're here and uh, with that, I would move to accept staff analysis and um, let's see, what else do I have to say? And to initiate the urban village planning process for Saratoga. Is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, Vice Mayor? Okay, Council Member Batra. Okay, thank you for the analysis which the vice mayor already complimented on, and I support every one of the statements made there. I got a couple of questions. One, there was a uh, urban village around Blossom Hill area somewhere identified. Is that anywhere in the running uh, in the list of the projects? 
So you, I think, are you talking about the, where the Oak Ridge Mall is essentially? That there is a, there's a lot, very large urban village, there's actually two of them on Blossom Hill Road, just south of 85. Um, those are ones that we're, we're not currently considering for developing a plan, I think in part based on the, the cost of development work that we've done. The market economics there, while they're not horrible, they're not in that sort of tier one market. They're, I think I believe they were in tier two. So right now we're really focused in on tier one. I think as things, the economics of development change, we, would, we could be looking at that. Um, I just want to note that where we are generally headed with where we plan for villages is really looking at where the market wants to build, um, where, the, where the market supports both market rate housing and commercial development. Um, the, the villages that we have planned in the past weren't entirely driven by that for various reasons. So we're kind of taking much more of a, of a market focus. The affordable housing component, just as a reminder, can go in any urban village at any time. So there isn't a need for the per planning for that. It's really the market rate housing and, and higher intensity commercial uses. Although, again, you can always do commercial <laughs> in urban villages if, if you want to now. Okay. Thank you for that. And it says in the memo that it takes one to two years to do the proper planning for one of the urban villages. Does that mean that that's the one which we have chosen now to do? That's all we are going to be doing in the next two years? And that's all is stated very softly. <laughs> Uh, yes, so that one, the uh, Saratoga, as well as Eastside Alum Rock Urban Village. So we'll be uh, launching those two early 2024. So considering what we have stated in our housing element, the number of units we need to build and all that, do we really need to be looking at more than one simultaneously? Well, so we are. So just so at so five wounds will be winding down, coming to council probably the middle of next year. The capital station area plan is wrapping up, coming to council at the end of this calendar year. Um, so we are looking ahead at other opportunities for planning. So there is a PDA grant application that's due. The PDA is a priority development area grant. It's issued by MTC. They have funded most of our village planning process. So we plan to submit a, a proposal for a grant funded urban village plan as part of that process in December. On top of that, um, you know, I think, you know, when you saw the list of one, two, and three of Saratoga, De Anza, and South Bascom, it's not to say like, okay, Saratoga won, sorry, De Anza, and South Bascom, you lost, see you later. We actually plan to um, go after, to actually do those urban villages coming up next. So one of the things we're considering is putting together a budget proposal for next fiscal year to fund one of those other urban villages. Based on this analysis, we would recommend De Anza. Um, so I just want to say we have two that are lined up that are funded, but we are looking for funding to do more. Okay. All right. Uh, that's good. Uh, the last thing. Is it fair to ask if our housing element plan today is the day when we are supposed to hear if it got approved? And Right. We anticipate hearing today, but we have not heard yet. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I don't know if the day ends at midnight or at five. Oh, I haven't I heard see. anything okay. today. Oh, so the suspense continues. <laughs> Correct. <right now>. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Chair Foley, okay. if I could also add, um, we've, we've committed to the city council that once we do receive the letter from the State Department of Housing Community Development, we would communicate that um, to the full council through our information memo. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Back to you, Chairperson. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just want to point out that one of the reasons that you uh, put South Bascom where it was was because of the higher displacement of the residential uh, tenants, which is really important that that was taken into consideration and that's why you're not suggesting going forward with this at this time. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping displacement, I mean, 
it, it's something very serious. We have a lot of development coming up on Bascom Avenue as it is, and one of them is a commercial property that those small businesses will be displaced. So I, uh, for one, am always thinking about that and concerned about it. So I am uh, thankful that you actually considered it as one of the priority items is the displacement of the residential tenants and, and, that, and the commercial tenants as well. And how many, uh, we have a lot of urban villages, areas that have been designated of urban villages. After we do this one, these two, the Five Wounds and the um, Saratoga Avenue, how many more urban villages are left to create plans? And I'm not suggesting I'm gonna be pushing for that because as Michael, as you said, some of those plans aren't, nece uh, villages aren't necessarily relevant anymore. Um, it's 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 around 50 50 okay 50 ish maybe it's 49 and 50 ish yeah okay that's yeah. kind of what I was thinking I just wanted to have an understanding all right thank you so much for your presentation and the report we have a motion we have a second let's vote thank you that motion carries now we're, thank you for your presentation so ends the end of PBCE at CD, CED today. We'll see you again. Uh, with that, uh, go to public comment. Blair. Hi, thank you, Blair Beekman. To comment on uh, the SJPD long-term checklist of community programs to be developed that were a part of a city council item last week, uh, please consider the civil rights and civil protections of check accountability along with the ideas of openness and accountability that simply organizes a better way of thinking and can be of help for most community practices, concepts, and projects. And that we are beginning a time to better consider where a full community engagement process on these issues is to also begin to better address oversight of the police and that the police themselves may not be needed as much in the future. Uh, in the same trust we're trying to develop for our school systems so we can all feel um, uh, that our schools can be safe and trusted places and that our teachers do not have to have guns in the classroom we should uh, be keeping this in mind for city hall we simply uh, we simply al always uh, should have to be con should be considering and developing good healing ideas for city hall and that it should be clear to ourselves that metal detectors should not be considered as a permanent long-term solution for our San Jose future. Let's be working to find ways to practice how to better trust each other and to feel safe with each other. Uh, I have reviewed your special study session on public meeting procedures last Thursday. I felt it was interesting to comment on the public comment time. San Jose City Government can always place small cameras within the small breakout sessions in the future and then offer these as, small, as individual breakout rooms within the Zoom meeting. Be creative, responsible, and fun with community demands and requests. And please be considering my continual ideas, feelings, and public comment that the Brown Act clearly states that each item called out at a city council meeting is simply allowed public comment time in San Jose, uh, is allowed public comment time. San Jose simply does not allow public comment on certain agenda items. Please be uh, considering and working on those things and we can have conversations. Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. While attending a county government meeting in a county government building at the uh, Behavioral Health Committee, I was literally approached by two officers and they threatened me that if you do not comply with our orders, we will use force against you. They kept saying, like, I was in a combative stance. I wasn't. I didn't commit a crime. You sick the police department on me while I was sitting there in that meeting. When it was time to leave, they were waiting for me outside. I was arrested. I was put in handcuffs and sat down. Now, if it wasn't for the, the skill, and I want to compliment him here and now, the skill of Officer Gutierrez in the way that he conducted that arrest and the way that he conducted everything, the way he de-escalated, de he, I, I tip my hat to him. He is the reason why I stand up for the police department when, the police, when it's necessary, because of officers like Officer Gutierrez. Because he understood, he goes, Soto, just wait, let me get the facts straight. 
And I told him, you cannot arrest me. And here's why. Number one, I am not on this building. It's not on the restraining order. Number two, the person here is not named. That's the second time that this city has tried to arrest me at a county government meeting. Now, the city attorney, you will be. My community isn't going to tolerate this anymore. They got an attorney. I got a hold of the dude today. Everything from what happened with Rebecca on. Every single time. You guys have tried to arrest me five times this year. Five. Unsuccessfully. Don't you ever mess with me when it comes to the law. I know the law. And that law in the power, the power of having that knowledge of the law is what took those handcuffs off of my hands and the response of Officer Gutierrez. I applaud and I respect that officer for doing... Back to the committee. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you.